Today, I am here with Tom Lovejoy, godfather of biodiversity and president of the Amazon Biodiversity Center. Tom, you've had several different roles in your life, such as seeing your fellow of the United Nations, even more working with presidents. What made you move from occupation to occupation and do so much at one time? It basically was, in many senses, I wasn't changing the subject matter of what I was working on. I was just finding new opportunities, often major opportunities uh, that shouldn't be missed. Uh, and as everybody knows, you make up life as you go. How did you find yourself in these roles? And what's the value of having so many of them? Well, you know, it, it never was sort of thinking about having a bunch of different roles. It was thinking about, you know, what are the best ways to make a difference on behalf of biodiversity in the Amazon. Did you find that staying in one didn't achieve the goal you were going for, so then you ended up taking on so many? Well, I think, you know, it it may clarify things a little bit that when I, when I was doing those things like advising in the H.W. Uh, Bush administration and the Clinton administration, being science envoy under Obama, uh, I was still basically working for either the Smithsonian or whatever my next job happened to be. <laughs> But those were additional roles, so I took them on at the same time, and they just, in a sense, amplified my ability to make a difference. So how did you move from the path of science to science leadership? So instead of pure research on the science side, moving to politics, things like that? Well, I think there are little hints of it along the way. But I think the real transition occurred when I became employee number 13 for a little organization called the World Wildlife Fund United States in 1973. And that was basically a, an organization which was about you know, making good, good things happen for the natural world. So all these roles that you've had, where do you believe all the work comes together? What is the end goal of everything you've done? Well, you know, the, where it really comes together is on the ground in, and in the natural world, uh, in actual conservation. Uh, yes, you have to, shall we say, uh, give people the opportunity to understand the issues um, before they will necessarily support it. Um, but once they do, uh, then it translates into a better future for whatever bit of conservation it's about. You've introduced many things during your time. What was the significance of introducing the term biological diversity to the scientific community in 1980? Well, there was a lot of interest in science at the time and in the actual subject of diversity. You know, why does a certain place or an island have so many species of lizards or birds or whatever it is? Uh, so it, it really wasn't too big a jump to just apply that to the, all the variety of nature. And there just wasn't a term for it. And, and the really interesting thing is that three of us used it in print in 1980 for the first time. None of us thought we were doing anything new, right? Uh, and none of us bothered to worry about who was first. It was only, you know, many years later that one of the three of us actually announced from the stage at the Natural History Museum in New York that I was the first. When you say the three of us, who do you mean? There were three, three of us who thought of it. Ed Wilson and Elliot Norris and me. 
and use it in print. Now, once it's in print, then people can't argue about it. Right? How did you begin working with those two? Well, because uh, they were actually interested in the conservation of the variety of nature. Elliot was at, at the Council on Environmental Quality, and Edward O. Wilson was already a famous biologist. Uh, and on his way to write many, many more books and do many, many more things, and he just had his 91st birthday. You've had the honor of winning many awards uh, throughout your work. Is there one that's felt particularly special? Well, that is a really interesting question. Uh, I suppose the Blue Planet Prize is the most special. Uh, I mean, it is, I think, considered, you know, the top international prize for environment. Uh, but I also think being recognized uh, a couple times by the Brazilian government, once for conservation and the other time for science uh, is pretty special. And because so much of, I, of what I do takes place in Brazil. Uh, and as I like to say, my heart beats according to the samba. Uh, that it, it was nice to know that my efforts were appreciated. So, how can other people play the role that you do? If your role could be replicated, how someone will not do it? Well, you know, there, there are people who are doing this kind of thing all the time. Uh, you know, on the science side, I would say that Carlos Nobre in Brazil, the climate scientist, is, is the number one. Uh, uh, but there, there are lots of people who are engaged in all of this and it, if there weren't I wouldn't be anywhere near as effective as I am. How do the lessons of the Amazon rainforest apply to us in America? So how can we take what you've learned and apply to where we are? Well the lesson of the Amazon is that one, it needs to be managed as a system so that it maintains the rainfall to be a rainforest. Uh, but the other big lesson of the Amazon is that ordinary approaches to economic development are more often than not are destructive rather than doing something that's sustainable in the long term. So, it, it's interesting, in the United States, in the, back in the 20s and 30s, there was a phenomenon called the Dust Bowl, when there was so much dust in the air that clouds of it arrived actually in Washington, D.C. And it's all because of the way people were treating the land farther to the west where there's less rainfall. Uh, and happily, the Civilian Conservation Corps and other measures uh, work to restore enough of the vegetation to get that under control. So there are parallels here and there. What, what is the cause of the increase in forest fires in the U.S. West, West, the Amazon, Australia, Siberia? In Australia and the western U.S., uh, it's primarily climate change driven, longer, drier, hotter, uh, months and months of weather like that. Uh, and, you know, once fire gets started, it's, it's sort of like, you know, it's like tinder. Uh, 
In the Amazon, it's different because the Amazon doesn't burn naturally. Uh, if lightning strikes in the Amazon, you don't get a forest fire because it's just too wet. So what's really causing fire in the Amazon is just destruction of the forest. Uh, and, you know, trying to have a campaign to stop the fires actually is much too late in the process to make a difference. It actually should be directed at controlling the deforestation. Because uh, once, once those trees are on the ground and you have five days without any rain, then they will burn. Could you elaborate on the destruction of the Amazon? So is it primarily deforestation? Are there other you know, man-made causes besides deforestation? Well, certainly, certainly in the beginning, uh, deforestation was the major impact on the Amazon. And when I first set foot in the forest, it was 97% intact. And it's actually pretty impressive because it's equal in area to the 48 contiguous United States. It's really big. Uh, today, it's pushing 20%. And that together with climate change, which is exerting its presence in the Amazon, such that there are every five years or so, historically unprecedented droughts, uh, and the extensive use of fire has brought those three factors together in a negative synergy that were very close to a point where you could, a tipping point where uh, the Amazon simply wouldn't be able to generate enough rain to have a rainforest, at least in the south and the east. What are the effects of the increased forest fires? Uh, well, like anywhere, there's a lot of smoke. So there's, you know, it's really bad for anything that breathes. Right? Not just people, anything that breathes. Uh, and one of the things that happens when you have a fire in a deforested area in the Amazon is that the fire often sort of invades the remaining surrounding forest uh, and it gets into the understory and kills a lot of the small saplings and things like that and dries it out, which makes it very vulnerable to fire the su succeeding year. Is this what it's going to be like for the rest of our lives? There's a, a bit of hope to put things back together. So there's always hope to put things back together, uh, assuming that we don't push the Amazon past its tipping point. Uh, and, you know, a conscientious effort at reforestation uh, would build a margin of safety against actually tipping the tipping point. And it would also do the world a benefit because it would be sucking up a lot of carbon back out of the atmosphere and thereby you know, contributing to reducing the climate change impact. So, so in the end, uh, what we really need to do is think about managing the Amazon as a system. We need to think about the planet as a linked biological and physical system, uh, not just a physical system, uh, and that we, we need to manage that system in a much more respectful way, which sounds very arrogant. But, but what that really means is we really have to manage ourselves and what we do uh, so we have reduced impact.
There's some efforts being made, like reaching out to legislators to write policy, to limit deforestation. What is a great project to you that is helping restore the Amazon? So one of the really interesting things is that most of the people in Brazil actually care about the Amazon and believe national policy should be to basically protect it. Uh, and interestingly enough, Brazil is the country with the greatest percentage recognition of the word biodiversity in the world. So the public is already there. The mainstream media are already there and have been for a long, long time. Uh, you just have one of these anomalous political situations where the, the long term is being ignored and a lot of reality is being ignored. Uh, that said, you know, the governors of most of the states in the Amazon actually are really interested in sustainable trajectories. I don't think that was necessarily true 30 or 40 years ago, but it, it is true today. Uh, so I'm, I'm very hopeful that if the Inter-American Development Bank launches a, an initiative on a sustainable Amazon for maybe the next 10 years or so, it could actually get a lot of traction and make a lot of difference. A lot of the work we do involves the indigenous Brazilians and people that live in the Amazon. Do you see your work as intersectional, also dealing with you know, race relations along with environmental? So uh, indigenous peoples are a very important part of this picture. Uh, they currently have control, legal control over 25% of the Amazon in demarcated indigenous reserves. And there, there are more that should be demarcated. Uh, and so happily they are mostly predisposed uh, towards a sustainable future for the Amazon because they have such a deep knowledge about the biodiversity and the nature, uh, and it's so intertwined with their lives and cultures uh, that you don't have to tell them it's important. They know it's important. Uh, so they're they're a big piece of the puzzle. Uh, another piece are the other sort of non-urban people who live in the Amazon uh, and, and have been living there you know, in, for hundreds of years since Europeans arrived. Uh, a lot of uh, genetic mixing. Uh, anyway, they're known as, as Ribeirinhos, which means the river edge people. And I mean, they've been figuring out for a long time what you can do successfully in the Amazon and what you can't. And so the world today owes chocolate to the indigenous peoples and the Vivedinos. Um, as I like to say, one of the great things about 1492 is you can put chocolate and sugar together for the first time. Um, so there, there's a lot in the Amazon that's fascinating and useful and of economic value if managed sustainably. And the first people to ask about those kinds of things are the indigenous peoples and the Ribeirinhos. What are the most immediate projects that need to be addressed? Well, you know, I think the most important thing is to get the deforestation under control. That's number one. Number two is to get some reforestation going to build back that margin of safety. And number three is 
to launch and promote a new vision of development in the Amazon that is not based on old-fashioned ideas of big highways and big hydroelectric projects, but actually is, is much more in tune with how the Amazon works. And for example, there are fish species which migrate in the course of their lifespans from the estuary to the Andes and back. And any hydroelectric dam that blocks the flow of, of the river cuts that off. So any future hydro projects, to the extent that they even might be useful, uh, should be run of river projects, things like that. And then we need to just in create huge incentives for scientists to really study the biodiversity of the Amazon and look for practical things that can come out of it. When tackling deforestation, do you find it more effective to reach out to policymakers to limit the people who can actually do the deforestation? Or talk to the people who do the deforestation directly and try to get them to just stop without having the the threat of a law. Well, it's a really important question, and uh, there are people who work with ranchers, uh, uh, scientists who work with ranchers, uh, and bring them around to a more sustainable outlook, and that's incredibly important. Uh, the Amazon Biodiversity Center is mostly focused on generating the science. Uh, and essentially being an interface with the, the world of public policy uh, to encourage more sustainable uh, trajectories. So the Amazon Biodiversity Center, what was lacking that you saw needed to be filled by creating the Amazon Biodiversity Center? So probably about 10 years ago, um, I concluded that what I had started initially as maybe a 20-year exercise actually needed to be in perpetuity, uh, generating the science, uh, training the future generations, giving them the opportunities uh, to do that. Uh, and also using the forest itself as a classroom for those mythical beasts called decision makers. Uh, and I realized sort of from experience that efforts of this kind of scale usually do not fare well in larger institutions over time because there is no institutional memory. And so someday somebody will say, well, why are we doing that? And the next day it's gone. Uh, so I had never actually wanted to create my own organization. I thought that was an ego trip. Uh, but I concluded along the lines of the thoughts we just touched on that we really needed to do something like that. And so we're now in, in our essentially, I guess, first full calendar year uh, as a freestanding organization, but essentially a second year, and working hard to build some continuity uh, so that all these good things can keep going, you know, ad infinitum. What can ordinary people, especially young people, do for the environment? So, you know, I really think that young people can affect the future uh, in ways that they may not even dream of. Uh, the, the voice of young people is actually very powerful, more than they sometimes realize. 
So, not that I don't want, you know, people who are older to be engaged on this too. Uh, but if you're young and this topic interests you, uh, you think it's important, uh, step number one is just learn more about it. Uh, step number two is find out about organizations that are working on it uh, and find ways to work with them. Uh, and who knows, you know, out of that may come an important new scientist for the Amazon, uh, an effective politician in Brazil for the Amazon, uh, an effective performing artists for the Amazon. Uh, so there's so many, so many ways in which somebody can make a difference uh, that nobody should think that they can't. Uh, I only have one little caveat to that, which is it's really important to learn enough about it to know that what you're talking about is scientifically sound. Um, and then actually just go for it any way you think you can make a big difference. So when young people are getting interested in the environment, it might be hard for them to find that passion to move from research to action. Um, what sparked you to move from just research, dabbling in this, to making it a full-time thing, moving towards the action? Well, I was actually taking that job with the World Wildlife Fund in the early 1970s. Uh, it seemed like a really interesting thing to do. I actually planned to do it for only two years and then go back to being just a scientist, having adventures. But I found it so intriguing in itself. And the more I knew about it, about it, the more important it seemed to me that I just never looked back. And all kinds of people who are trying to make a difference love to, to have interns and, and uh, young people helping them. Uh, and so it, it shouldn't be too hard to get started, actually. If you could travel to the future and see what the ABC is doing then, what would make you so happy? What is your vision for the ABC? Well, I would love to see the Amazon, you know, sustainably developed, intact, the hydrological cycle essentially secure. Uh, and I would love to see the Amazon Biodiversity Center as a key player in all of that, but not the only player. We need a lot of others to get engaged. Thank you so much for speaking to me today. Uh, Tom Lovejoy from the Amazon Biodiversity Center. Well, thank you.